Hello everyone, welcome to lesson four. This is a lesson where we apply the supply and demand mechanics that you learned in lesson three to actual examples. So what I've done is I've pulled some old test questions out that I thought were uh, useful and I've let it set them out in this video. So here we go. The process is actually kind of simple. If I can get this thing to work, here we go. First, you draw the graph and mark equilibrium just as you did before. Many of you think this is too simple and you'll try to skip it, but I don't recommend you do because when you get in the test you're kind of stressed, uh, you haven't slept well perhaps, it's really a good idea to have this routine. Go ahead and draw it out, it won't take you very long. Then you read over the story and identify which curves move. Almost all the time only one curve will move. Oftentimes students will think two curves will move or it'll move in two directions or some crazy thing. But 99.9% .9 of the time, one curve moves. If you think both curves have moved, you've probably got it wrong. Third, you just apply the graph. Let me get my image out of the way here. You just apply the graph that goes with the curve you've moved. It's just that simple. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, get started. Now here's a situation I put on an old test. It's been in the uh, news many times over the last few years. Assume the government, that is the U.S. government, puts a large tariff on imported steel. So what would that do to many markets? So here are four markets that I've identified on an old test that I thought would make good supply and demand examples. If the United States government puts a large tariff on imported steel, what would happen in the market for foreign steel sold in the United States? What would happen in the market for U.S. made steel? And what would happen in the market for U.S made aluminum and what would happen in the market for US made cars. Okay, so uh, you can pause this video if you like and go ahead and work those out. In fact, that's a good idea. Remember, in each case one curve moves, the other one stays the same. So go ahead and get out your answers and then uh, press play again and I'll show you uh, the answers that I have. Alright, so uh, these are your templates that I hope you've drawn. So in the first case, what happens in the market for foreign steel is pretty easy. A tariff is a tax. A tax, if you remember from lesson two, is just a determinant of a supply curve. So when you put this tax or this tariff on foreign steel, you cause the supply curve for foreign steel to shift back to the left. The demand curve for foreign steel would stay the same. In fact, customers of foreign steel might even be unaware of the tariff. They probably would be unaware of it unless they just happen to read about it in the news. But when the supply curve shifts back to the left, a new equilibrium would be established here and the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied of foreign steel sold in the United States would both decrease and the price would increase. So if you were filling these out in a little grid, and I think I have a grid here for you, it would be like this. The demand curve for foreign steel stays the same. The supply curve of foreign steel decreases. The quantity demanded and quantity supplied would both decrease. And the price would increase. All right, so that's the first one. So let's try what would happen then in the market for U.S. made steel. So first you have to ask, well, what is the relationship between U.S. made steel and foreign steel? And I hope all of you can see that they are substitutes for each other. And now as the price of foreign steel has gone up and they are substitutes for each other, the demand curve for U.S. made steel would increase. Remember? Uh, price of substitutes is a determinant of demand curves. So logically people would buy more U.S. steel because foreign steel is now more expensive than it was before. We would establish a new equilibrium here. The uh, supply curve of U.S. made steel would stay the same. But at the new equilibrium the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied would both increase and the price of U.S. made steel would increase. So if you're filling out your grid it would be, let's see, 
the US the demand curve for US made steel increased. The supply curve stayed the same. The quantity demanded and quantity supplied both increased. And the price increased. Notice the price of steel has gone up, both US made steel and foreign made steel. So that will be important later. The third question is well, what happens in the market for US made aluminum? Sometimes students will argue that, well, nothing happens to aluminum because they can't see how steel and aluminum are related. But if you think about it just a minute, I hope you can see that aluminum and steel are substitutes for each other. Not in every use, but in many uses they are. So as steel becomes more expensive, and it has, then uh, people would be eager to find uh, ways to substitute aluminum instead. So the demand curve for aluminum would increase. The supply curve for aluminum would stay the same, but at the new equilibrium, the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied of aluminum would both increase, and the price of aluminum would increase. So I hope you can see that. That's exactly the same thing that happened in the case of US Steel. So we could just sort of copy these things and bring them down. I wonder if that'll work. Oh, yeah, it did. All right, so that's uh, the third one. Then the last one was what happens in the market for U.S. made cars? And uh, well, in the case of U.S. made cars, what is the relationship between the price of steel and the price of aluminum in cars? A lot of times students are tempted to move the demand curve, but in this case the demand curve doesn't move. In fact, I doubt very many buyers of cars even know the price of steel or their price of aluminum. They're most likely very ignorant about those things. All that happens to them is they know they want a new car and they walk on the lot and they look at the quality of the cars, the size of the cars, and their prices. So the demand curve hasn't moved, but with the higher prices of aluminum and steel, the supply curve for U.S. made cars would shift back to the left. It's harder now to make cars than before because steel costs more and so does aluminum. We would establish a new equilibrium here. So the demand curve stays the same. The supply curve has decreased. The quantity demanded and quantity supplied have both decreased and the price has increased. So in our grid it would be uh, let's see, the demand curve stays the same. The uh, supply curve has decreased. The quantity demanded and quantity supplied have both decreased. And the price has increased. All right, so that exhausts the first one. So that, that takes care of that one off of an old test. And then I found uh, this example off an old test, which would give us uh, a couple of different ones. Imagine that there's a new technology that makes it easier to extract crude oil. And anybody who's read the newspaper in the last two years knows that this is big, big news, that there is a new technology that makes it easy to get uh, crude oil out of the ground that was previously trapped in very small, uneconomical pockets deep in the earth but now with this uh, process called fracking, it's possible to get that oil out uh, actually kind of inexpensively and the price of crude oil is falling and so forth. Anyway, it's all in the news. So here we go. Imagine there's a new technology that makes it easier to extract crude oil. What would happen in the market for crude oil? What would happen in the market for coal? And what would happen in the market for gasoline? All right, so take a minute, draw those out, and then uh, replay this video to see if you got the same answers as me. Okay, so what would happen in the market for crude oil? Well, keep in mind that this new technology, uh, technology is a determinant of supply curve, so with this new technology the supply curve for crude oil would shift to the right. We would establish a new equilibrium down here. The quantity demanded and the quantity supplied of crude oil would both increase and the price of crude oil would fall. Then uh, what would happen in the market for coal?
coal, we'll keep in mind that coal and crude oil are substitutes. And so if crude oil got cheaper, the demand curve for coal would fall, since substitutes is a determinant of demand curves. The price of coal would then fall as we establish this new equilibrium down here, and the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied of coal would both decrease. Then finally, what happens in the market for gasoline? Well, I hope everyone knows that crude oil is a primary ingredient in the production of gasoline. Gasoline comes from crude oil. So if crude oil is uh, less expensive than before, uh, it would be easier to make gasoline. So the supply curve for gasoline would shift out to the right, establish a new equilibrium down here. So the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied would both increase and the price of gasoline would decrease. So um, but there are your answers and your drawings for those three questions. If we were going to fill in our uh, little grid here, in the first case, the demand curve for crude oil stayed the same, but the supply curve increased and the quantity demanded and quantity supplied both increased and in this case the price decreased whoops I spelled that wrong then uh, what happens in the market for coal well coal is a substitute for crude oil so in the case of coal the demand curve would decrease the supply curve would stay the same. The quantity demanded and the quantity supplied would both decrease and the price would decrease. Then what happens in the market for gasoline? Well, crude oil is an input in the production of gasoline. It get easier to make gasoline so the demand curve would stay the same. People probably are completely ignorant when they go to the gas station how hard it is to make it, uh, but the supply curve would increase and the uh, quantity demanded and the quantity supplied would both increase and the price would decrease. Alright, so I want you to take a minute and look at these. These are the five different ways that the curves can move. Let's see if we can find them. Here's a decrease in the supply curve, a increase in the supply curve, an increase in the demand curve, and a decrease in the demand curve. So some of them I've repeated, but there are the uh, four, other than the uh, uh, price floors and price ceilings, there are the four things it might be. Then I want you to notice that what's happened to quantity demanded and quantity supplied? Quantity demanded and quantity supplied have moved every time in exactly the same direction. Whatever one did, the other did. That will always be true when you move from one equilibrium to another. Because equilibrium, after all, simply means that quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. So if you were at equilibrium and then you move to a new one, if one moved, the other had to move. All right, so let's see if I can get back to the PowerPoint. That's the end of uh, this lesson, lesson four, and then lesson five is a special case of price floors and price ceilings. So uh, there I am. Hope you found this helpful, and uh, don't forget to practice, and good luck.